What we try to focus on are universal things, things that no matter where you are in the world, this is something that is going to be valuable. Jack, I am so excited for this. I know it is your first podcast. Welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here. I want to start with your entry into the world of design. How did you make your way into the world of design first, Jack? Yeah, well, I'll take you way back for this one because it really is kind of a a life story more than anything. Finding myself and finding design, I think, kind of went hand in hand. But, you know, if I go back to just really, you know, like elementary school, middle school, high school, and just kind of my academic experience, I found that, you know, I was always kind of okay at a lot of things, right? I, I could I could do fine in every subject, but I never felt like I truly excelled in one subject over others. And I actually had this like, this envy for those that did, you know, the the, the kids that were extremely good at math or brilliant writers or, you know, loved science, whatever it was, it just, I was envious of it because it seemed like their, their path was charted for them. They knew what they wanted to do. They knew what they were great at. You know, they, they could go major in that thing in college. They could go do that thing for the rest of their career. And I just felt like, ah, you know, I kind of like a lot of these things. I'm okay at many of them, but I don't have one thing that I'm just great at. And so when I went to college, you know, I, I, I actually didn't really know what I was going to major in and I stumbled upon product design and I took this introductory class in product design and I very quickly realized that the exciting thing about design was that it was so interdisciplinary. What makes you a good designer is being able to kind of dip your toes into a lot of different areas and then bring them together and synthesize them into into something different, something new. And so I kind of went through this journey and you know, the thing that I had seen as a weakness for, you know, basically my entire time through through school, I started to see as a strength. And that was super empowering for me. And, you know, it just made me fall in love with design. And, you know, I, I waffled on that a little bit. You know, I ended up getting a master's in mechanical engineering because I felt like design was too broad and I needed some technical depth. But that was really what, what you know, that was the final nail on the coffin because I quickly realized I was a shitty engineer. But I was a pretty good designer. And so why try to be something I'm not? Okay, so you realize then you're a pretty good designer and you have this passion and love for product design. How does Snap come about? I heard this was a fun story. How did the Snap start happen? Yeah, so I mean, you know, the pursuing the masters is a good segue because I was I was in the middle of my masters. I was actually going to need, you know, one summer and then and then finish my master's program in the fall. But um, in the course of that, I, I went and I interviewed at, at Snap and I actually interviewed for an internship role. I was going to fill that summer between, you know, starting and finishing my master's uh, with an internship. And, you know, at the time when I was interviewing, uh, it was the, I think it was December of 2013. And so Snap was still a small company. It's probably about 25 people when I was interviewing. I flew down to LA. I went on a walk on, on you know, along Venice Beach with Evan and, um, through the course of the interview, he basically convinced me that I would not want to go back to school if I started at Snap. And, you know, the reason I was talking to Snap in the first place was because I saw that they were doing something special. You know, they had recently turned down a major acquisition offer. And uh, that made me think they they have a vision, right? They, if you're turning down billions of dollars, it's because you know what you want to do. You have a big vision and you're going, you're pursuing it. And that really drew me to it. And over the course of this interview, Evan basically convinced me that I wasn't going to want to go back to school after I started at Snap. Uh, so, you know, I didn't tell him in that moment that my mind had been changed. And, you know, I just was excited to, to get the offer as an intern. But over the course of the next quarter, I accelerated my program so that I could actually jam enough classes in that I could graduate by the time I started as an intern. And so on day one, I walk in through the doors and within an hour, you know, I'm sitting down with Evan with a few other people who had started that day. And he's asked, you know, he's like, hey, how you doing? And I'm like, oh, I'm good. You know, just graduated a few weeks ago. Excited to jump in. He's like, you just graduated. He's like, why are you an intern? <laughs> I was like, well, I didn't realize I was going to graduate by this time. He's like, well, do you want to be full time? I said yes. And so I was an intern for about an hour. And I think I, you know, I know for a fact I hold the shortest internship uh, ever in Snap history. And that might extend well beyond into, into tech history of some sorts. But you know, I'm very grateful for Evan taking that that you know that chance on me and pretty fun story. 
I mean, clearly it was right to take that bet. Um, my, my question to you is, I'm sorry, this is off schedule, but, you know, we, we always hear about Ev's kind of product shops being so stellar and so world class. You've seen it now over, gosh, what is that, nine years. What makes Ev so great at product one? And how's his approach to product changed over nine years? Yeah, it's a really great question. And, you know, I think a lot of what you'll hear from me today you know, is an articulation of things that I've I've learned, you know, from working closely with Evan and, and seeing the way he operates. And, you know, I think one of the things that really sets Evan apart is his willingness. And, and it's not just a willingness, it's his desire to do things differently. He will not just take something as the right way because it's the way it's always been done. He questions everything and he always pushes for something different. And the reality is, if you're pushing for something different, that's the only way you can ever do something better. And so, you know, that's, I think, really been the the cultural impetus for all of the innovation that's come out of Snap is just this willingness, you know, from Evan at the top and then culturally ingrained throughout the the, the business and the, and the company to just push for something beyond, something different than the way it's always been done. Can I ask you, I spoke to Jeremy on your team before the show, and it's so funny you say that. He said that one of your superpowers is questioning everything, questioning conventions the way that it is now. My question to you is, how do you think about questioning conventions that are conventions for a reason? It's it's that way because it is best that way versus it's that way because it's always been that way. Yep. Therein lies the challenge. I mean, that that's the challenge of, of product and design and and prioritization and operating, you know, in, in, in a company is there's always going to be this nuance and there's going to be a level of instincts and intuition you have to apply to this. But I think when it comes to questioning convention, like the most important thing to just set the stage is to help people understand why it's so important to question conventions in the first place. Right. And, and ultimately it comes back to this idea that if you're doing things the way things have always been done, especially as, you know, the underdog in an industry with giant incumbents, you're always going to be playing catch up. The only way to win is to try to do something differently. Now, there's always risk involved in that. And so you have to try to question these conventions quickly. You have to try to do them in, in, in the way that you can validate or invalidate whether or not that convention is the right one as fast as you possibly can. And now, you know, some conventions aren't worth questioning. You're right. You know, I think there are certain things you just take it as truth, right? Like, I think we, we can safely say that, um, you know, having a CEO of an organization, at least for Snap, it's the right thing to do. We don't need to question that. We don't need to try a two in the box or anything wild. We've got a good thing going and, and we're going to stick to it. But when it comes to the product and when it comes to the way, you know, these systems are built and the things that people like, I think you have to, you have to start from a position of really being willing to question everything. And the way you de-risk that is making sure that you can, you know, answer that question as to whether or not that convention is correct or not as quickly as possible. And if you start there and then you apply some instincts around, you know, those conventions that really we don't need to waste our time questioning it, only then can you really create that culture where you innovate long term. I told you don't look at the schedule because it's complete bullshit. Um, <laughs> how do you reduce that decision-making cycle? Is it through testing markets like Australia and getting quick feedback before deploying to major markets? How do you shorten that decision-making timeline and make it as comprehensive as possible where you get enough data, but also not too long where something bad can persist for too long? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think it comes down to really defining what level of fidelity you need in order to answer that question. Ultimately, what you're doing is you're building a prototype. You're doing a prototype to test the hypothesis to see if, you know, is this thing the right thing for us to do? And prototype is a really broad term. And there's so many different ways to build a prototype. Yes, you can build the production code. You can test it, you know, in, in a market like Australia and see how it's changing, you know, the metrics, how people are, are using it. You can also you know, design a mock and have people look at it and get a sense of, you know, whether or not that thing feels right. You can build that in prototyping tools that are available today so that you can try it internally. That's probably our most active use of a prototype is, you know, our design team or design engineers will come together, come up with the concept. They'll build it in a way that we could never ship it, but they can get it done in, you know, a few hours rather than a few months. And we'll try it internally. And, you know, I think we've brought people in who have really strong product sense. 
really great intuition, intuition that's been informed over hundreds and hundreds of experiments over a long period of time. And you use that to validate that. So again, there's there's a spectrum there. Sometimes you're giving it to you know real customers and, and you're listening to their feedback. Sometimes you're just toying with it internally. When I think about product innovation, I think about a Snap and Apple together in the same realm. And I'm gonna I'm gonna expand on that. You both have the unique ability to make me hate your products for the first hour when I try the new feature. And a week later I think, why did I ever use the home button on an iPhone before when I can simply swipe up? but I hated losing my home button. My question to you is, when change happens, consumers hate it, whether it's good or bad, but how do you know whether it's good change with delayed data or bad change and they just hate it? Yeah, it's a, it, it's a really good question. Right? Consumers do generally hate change. It's hard, right? You have to change your habits. You have to do something. There's friction involved in, in changing the way that you use something. And you know, for the most part, if you're not the one working at the company, really thinking about the long-term strategy in the details, making these decisions, and it's just, you know, thrown at you, that can be a little bit disconcerting. And and so you have to choose as an organization, do you want your customers to hate the products you ship every time you do something dr drastically different, or do you want the company to die, right? That's the choice you have in front of you. And so we always choose the former. Now, I think to, to answer your question directly, right? How do you know? And again, I think it comes back to being able to use these things internally and sit with them for a while, right? That can give you a level of confidence that, hey, you know, we didn't like this thing at first either. It was hard to get used to. We had to change our habit. You know, this button went to the other side, whatever it might be. But we've been sitting with it for weeks and we understand that, you know, our curve of frustration versus value add has has really changed over time. And so we can expect we'll see the same thing out of the community. Now, of course, you can also track these through tests with, you know, you know, an A-B test that you you let run for for more than just a week. You can let it run for months if you need to. And based on the level of risk, sometimes that's the right thing to do. But I think the other layer to this is your level of conviction, right? You have to understand how much pain are we willing to take in order to get to where we want to go. And the answer to that question is all about how much conviction you have and where you want to go. If you have a huge amount of conviction, you're willing to take a lot of pain. If you don't have that much conviction, you need to be a little bit more thoughtful with the way you roll things out and the feedback you get around it. And you got to let that inform all the decisions you make until you found that thing that has an enormous amount of conviction. I'm too interested. Um, can you take me to product features? that you released and customers hated, but then turned into great features and they loved over time. And then one that you released, they hated, and it was because it was shit. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I mean, I have so many examples of the former. I mean, you know, I think the most famous example here is definitely Stories. You know, when Stories released, it, it wasn't immediate, you know, overnight success. This is something that took months for um, the community to adopt and and start to use and kind of get that flywheel, you know, moving and get people comfortable with what this new thing was. Um, but it obviously got there and it got there, in, you know, in a really meaningful way. And I think in many ways it's it's changed the industry. So, you know, I think that is the classic example. You know, I think another one is the Snap Map, which, you know, this was one where we had seen some emerging behaviors on the platform that really led us to to believe that this would be very valuable. We knew a couple things that were unique about our platform. You know, we knew that this was a close friend platform, right? This is a place where the people you friend are actually the people you know in real life. It's the people you trust. It's the people you have, you confide in, right? This is, this is your, this is your click. It's your close friends. And so that allows us to do some things that might be more sensitive in broader social graphs, like location sharing. At the same time, you know, it is something that can make people uncomfortable. And so when we rolled out the Snap Map, a lot of people were like, this is an invasion of privacy. But the reality is, by default, you're not sharing your location. There's a flow where you have to say, I want to share my location, and then you're going to select the friends that you're comfortable sharing it with. And we made sure that that you know, flow was crystal clear and it was something that you're opting in every step of the way. And so I think it took a little while for folks to get comfortable, but at the end of the day, they realize that this is an opportunity to see exactly, you know, 
where their friend is when they need them. And we, again, you know, this was really inspired by an emerging behavior, which was people were posting to their story with a geo filter, which kind of tagged their location. And they'd, you know, add a caption like, hit me up, which basically meant, I'm at this location, come hang out. And when their friend would arrive, they'd actually delete that snap from their story. So that indicated to us that there was, you know, there was a problem here that our community was finding it difficult to, to meet up with friends and we could make that easier. Okay. I might have gone way off the question there, but no, 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 that's perfect. Before we move to the one that failed, I'm fascinated. You mentioned the stories there. I obviously had Alex on from Meta and him and Kevin Wilde were both, both like, yeah, it was a rip off. Like when we did it, how do you guys feel and respond when you see a rip off of a product that you created? I'm just interested. Yeah, no, it's a, it, it's a great question. I mean, I think that we've quickly become very comfortable with it. And we've recognized that this is going to be a reality. And I think more than anything, find it exceptionally motivating. Because not only does it validate all the work that you've done, but it also, you know, lights a fire under your ass to go continue innovating. Every single time we do something that then that is then adopted across other platforms, you know, we recognize that, you know, we've hit something, right? Something within humanity that resonated. And that's exciting. But it also, you know, makes you realize that you have to keep doing that over and over again. I think it's also helped us think about, you know, what are the things that we're really uniquely positioned to do? What are the things that that really differentiate our platform? And, you know, while Stories has, you know, been successful on other platforms, the way Stories are used on Snapchat is still fundamentally different. It's still more raw, authentic, in the moment content. There's less of this need to be, you know, pretty or perfect. And, you know, that makes the ethos of the platform fundamentally different. And that's because the way people use the platform is different from what they expect from, you know, other platforms. So I think we're, we're always looking to lean into those unique advantages. The Snap Map's a perfect example of that, right? The close friend graph makes us uniquely positioned to put something out in the world that might be a little bit more sensitive to share and you're only comfortable sharing it with your close friends. Those were things that worked over time when we saw that work. What was just like, it was what we call a smelly fish in the UK, which is like, mm -mm, it didn't work and it continued to not work. Yeah, you know, there are plenty of, of products and features. I find them a little bit less memorable for many reasons because they're not something we're thinking about every single day and iterating on, right? And, and, you know, what I've found too, is that the process that, that we use, you know, it, it, it leads to pretty high success rate. And, and that's because ultimately we are reading out hundreds of ideas before they go out the door, before they're, they're shipped to hundred percent. Now there are things that we have, I think, you know, push for really hard and ultimately had to wind down, you know, this, this last year we had to, to wind down our games effort. You know, we had, a, we had a product that was built on the fact that our community was spending so much time in the same chat talking with one another. You know, a lot of these conversations are synchronous in real time. That's the way people are spending time on Snapchat. And a lot of that time is also spent in video calls and calling. And so we thought there was an exciting opportunity to, to build something that would be incremental to that experience and, and, and make it easier to connect and more fun to connect. And, and so we kind of developed this, this game platform. And we saw some really exciting signs of success. And I think ultimately, you know, what we've experienced, just given the environment we've been in over the last year, you have to wind down certain things in order to focus on the things that have the biggest opportunity. And it's not always because those things don't have a path to success, but sometimes it's because that path to success is too long or it's too distracting from the thing that's going to be most important long term. I, essentially, I had Toby on the show from Shopify, and he said, actually, the best companies are defined by constraints. That said, constraints can be fucking annoying. <laughs> uh, uh, but yes, I totally get you. Uh, before we dive into the actual workings, I, I am intrigued. I, the horrible question, so forgive me for it. But when we think about we've spoken about kind of different testing mechanisms. We've spoken about kind of ideation processes. Is product more art and science? And where do you sit on this debate? Yeah, you know, I, I love this question because I think you kind of have to get one thing out of the way, which is product can't possibly be all art or just all science, right? If product was only art, it would just be art. And if it were just science, it would just be science. But it's not. It's something different. And, you know, frankly, I think we can both agree it's something that's more exciting 
And and I think my answer probably would surprise a lot of people who work with me because of how much I champion the importance of intuition and, and creativity within the product and, and design process. But I would say that's actually more science and maybe not for the for the reasons you might think, but because I think it actually the the process of design and product resembles the scientific process far more than it resembles the artistic process. Um, and I can get concrete there, right? The scientific method is you make an observation, something that's happening out in the world, and you form a hypothesis about what's happening. And then you create some experiments to test that hypothesis. And then you iterate until you feel like you've uncovered what's going on. Now, the design thinking process, which you know I, I use interchangeably with the, the product process, again, you know, coming from design, I kind of view everything through that lens, is very similar. Instead of making an observation, you, you, you define a problem, right? You observe a problem that's happening, something that people are dealing with that's making their life less than ideal in some small or major way. You form a hypothesis about how to solve that problem. You build a prototype to test that hypothesis with real people, and then you iterate. And so ultimately, what's the difference between the scientific method and you know the design thinking process is that design thinking starts out with a problem and it ends with a new solution. Whereas the scientific method starts out with a question or an observation and it hopes to end with a new understanding. And so product is really like this adaptation of the scientific method that's used to solve a problem by creating something new, not just to understand why something's happening in the first place. And so that's the way I see like this is there, there's the the scientific part of it because it's like the process of the scientific method but the difference that ability to create something net new that's where the art comes in because like art when you're creating something you have to do th so through the filter of of the human mind and to do that well you need to use imagination you need to use creativity you need to have a cultural understanding and that's the art so i don't know like 80 20. Is that what Jeremy meant when he said to me about your approach to creating a repeatable process for product innovation? I think that that is probably what he was referring to. Yes. Um, and I think, you know, we can get a little bit more specific on that, which is there are certain elements to that process that are really important to define because there are things that can allow that process to be very successful. And there are things that can hold that process back. And I think the first thing to really think about an ingredient for success here is you kind of have to take a step back and you have to think about what is creativity in the first place. Because having a creative organization is table stakes for this repeatable process of innovation actually working. And you know, somebody probably from some dictionary somewhere is going to come out and tell me that this is not the definition of, of, of creativity. But this is how I've always defined it, which is taking two distinct ideas and merging them together into something new. That is creativity in a nutshell. You know, no idea comes out of thin air. They're all built on different ideas. But what creates something novel is actually bringing these disparate ideas together. And so that, that's kind of like the, the foundation on which this entire system sits. But what's interesting is, you know, what is the best way to create an environment where you have a bunch of, you know, unique ideas coming together? And that's where the importance of having a really diverse workplace comes in because you are much more likely to get different ideas merging together if you have people with different lived experiences collaborating. And so ultimately, in order to set up this process for repeatable innovation, you have to have creativity. And to have creativity, you have to have diversity of thought. And you have to encourage that and you have to embrace it. And so that's the foundation from which this process you know, really sits atop. How does idea submission work internally? I have good staff, the CPO at Spotify on the show, and he said, talk is cheap, so we should do more of it, um, which I thought was quite an interesting statement. How do you think about like idea generation and submission internally to ensure that you hear the best ideas? Yeah, I, I actually really like that, You know, the idea that, that talk is cheap. I think I would add maybe a caveat to that, which is talk is cheap, if you set up an environment where it feels that way. Because talk can be very expensive 
or it can take a toll if you don't feel like you're in an, envi- an environment where it's safe to talk. And so, you know, maybe another fundamental ingredient of creating a creative culture is creating psychological safety, right? If you feel like if you make a mistake or you have an idea that's, you know, somebody's had a million times or somebody else thinks is bad, you're not going to share that. And if you're not sharing that, you know, we're not going to have as many ideas to choose from. And ultimately, you know, the idea we pursue is only as good as the number of ideas we've had to choose from. And now it can be difficult to choose the right idea to go pursue, right? And that's where a lot of this process comes into play. But ultimately, you know, the more ideas you have up front, the more likely you are to find a gem. And so I think it is really critical that you are encouraging that within, you know, the, the, the environment and making people feel really safe. How do you literally do that, Jack? I, I love the idea of psychological safety. Nicely said, hard to do. How does one do that? I think it's, it's all about behaviors. I mean, you have to model it from the top and you have to encourage it all the way down. And so you have to reward people, right? When somebody brings an idea to the table, you have to thank them for that idea. You know, when somebody says something that goes against the grain and you know that it probably took a little bit of courage to say that thing, you have to reward them for it. And you have to do that publicly and you have to, you have to do it yourself. You know, one of my favorite things to do when I'm offering up an idea to a team is to preface it with the fact that, hey, this is a stupid idea because that just helps everybody realize that it's okay to share stupid ideas. Um, and you know, when other people are doing that, you just got to let, you got to give it room to breathe. And so I think there's no better way to create a culture of psychological safety than to make sure that you are rewarding people when they're taking risks and you're doing that in a way that's public. So other people see that it's okay. When you think about the options that you have in front of you with ideas coming in, how do you think about a framework for prioritization when there's three that you could choose, but resource constraints mean that you can only do one. Is it like yes. upside planning? Is it ease of execution? What is the fact that determines your choice? It's a combination of all of these things, right? I, I would actually put a lot of this, you know, I would kind of bucket it in, into three different areas. One is, you know, what is the potential impact, right? What is the opportunity size of doing this idea? Two is what is the cost? What is the engineering cost? How much time will it take? How many resources to make it successful? And then there's this third bucket, which, you know, is kind of the art part of this whole thing, which is what is your gut instinct into how important this is for our long-term vision or how much people are going to like it, you know, and, and that's a little bit of instinct. And so you have these three buckets and then you basically- Can I, can I add one? Can I add yeah, one? Yeah, please. Pro- probability of outcome and execution. Like if it's a 95% that you will be able to do it versus a 3% flyer, it would also change decision-making processes. I think that's exactly right. You know, and I think a lot of that comes out in the like cost to build it, right? That can help you understand, you know, it's it's not just about, um, you know, how long is it going to take? It's about the opportunity cost, right? If we spend three months trying this and we can't get it out the door, then, you know, that's three months wasted. And so you've got those three buckets and you you have to apply relative weighting to them, right? High, medium, low impact, high, medium, low cost, high, medium, low gut feel, if something's high impact, low cost, high gut feel, build it yesterday. If it's, you know, l- low impact, high cost, forget about it. If it's somewhere in the middle, if I had a perfect answer for you, I'd, I'd spend, you know, half the amount of time at work. That's the hard part. Can I ask, you see many different product tools today as well. And we have, you know, thousands of product leaders and hundreds of thousands of founders. What big mistakes do you see people make and product teams make in their product processes? I think the most common mistake I see is people becoming too hung up on a solution and spending too much time on a specific solution rather than spending all of that time really understanding the problem and defining the problem. Because you can get really excited about a solution, but ultimately, if it's not solving the right problem, it's not worth doing. And and so if you can really get deep around the problem you're going to solve, then I think your path to success is going to be much higher probability. I totally agree with you. In these meetings and with these kind of prioritization decisions, Sometimes people will make mistakes and sometimes on execution, people will make mistakes. 
And again, having to talk the shit out of you, I know your strengths and weaknesses. And one of them is you support people selflessly. Um, great, but sometimes someone is actually just not good enough. My question to you is, how do you know when to continue supporting someone versus when to cut the cord and say, you know, Jack, this is the third time now. I'm sorry, it's not working. Yeah, it's a it's it's a really great question. Something I spend a lot of time thinking about, and and uh, you know I take very seriously. If there's good intentions, you have to start by giving it time, right? If there are bad intentions, you got to change something very quickly, and you and you got to make a decision. You probably you know that person needs to go. But let's assume good intent, because 99 percent of the time people have good intent, and so. If their intent is good, but their execution is flawed or they've made mistakes or their judgment was bad, you have to deliver feedback in real time. You have to help them understand what mistakes they made, why they might have made them, and what your expectations are. Where is your bar? What is good enough? And you know what I've found is it's that if you're having that conversation frequently and and you know very candidly, and again, the best way to have a candid conversation like that with a team member is to have it come from a good place. If you have good intentions as that person's you know, leader or manager, it's going to be much easier to deliver tough feedback because they're going to know it's coming from a good place. So that's how you make those conversations easier to have. And once they're easier to have, you can have that conversation way more consistently. And Harry, what I've found is that by doing that, you know, the number of times I've had to let somebody go is actually relatively small. And it's not because I don't take performance management seriously, but it's because through these series of conversations, that person either gets better or they realize that this isn't the role for them or this isn't the place for them and they choose to leave themselves. Can I ask you something I'm, I'm struggling with now? Um, always dangerous to use real-time uh, situations in a, a podcast <laughs> that I lack morals and scruples and so I will anyway. Um, uh, it's when you do care. And you actually do really care about the person. For me, it's not easier. It hurts more because, bunny, if I don't, sorry, Jack, you're not good enough. And I'm bunny, I don't really care about you. Sorry. But when I do really care, it pains me that you're not good enough. And I'm sad for you, for me. Do you see what I mean? It, it I do. hurts more. And and it, it resonates deeply because I, I struggled with that for a very long time. And look, don't get me wrong. I still struggle with it, right? It's it's never my favorite thing to do to to get out of bed in the morning and then go have a tough conversation with somebody I, I, you know, really, really like and, and, and want to see succeed. But I have seen enough times that had, you know, I've had to go have those tough conversations with people I really cared about who had really good intent, but just weren't cutting it. And what I've seen every single time, Harry, is that that person, whether it's, you know, a month later or six months later or a year later is better for it. They have found something that is a better use of their time, that is a better match to their skills, and that makes them more fulfilled. You know, if you're really struggling in a role, you know, not to say everybody shouldn't be challenged all the time. You should. I'm struggling all the time. But if you really aren't, you know, meeting those expectations, the basic expectations of the role you're in, I can guarantee you, you're not enjoying yourself and you're not finding it fulfilling. And so it's much better to, you know, let that person go find the thing that they're going to love because we all deserve that. What are you struggling with most today? Where do I start? <laughs> I, you know, I struggle. I, I think every, it, every day is a constant struggle, right? And ultimately for me, that's what makes it all so enjoyable and so rewarding, right? If there's no struggle, if there's no journey, you really don't appreciate the outcomes on the other side. I would can say, I, can I ask you, J yeah. Jack, I, one thing that came from my references on you was perfection. Um, you know, you're a great surfer. You're a fantastic father. You're a fantastic husband. You're an incredible product leader. Do you feel the pressure to keep everything perfect? Now you're, this, you're sounding a lot like my therapist. And uh, so, I, you know, this is something I talk about a lot. I would not say that I, I, I have, you know, I would actually not consider myself a perfectionist by any means. I think that I obviously work really hard and across a bunch of different areas and I try to be a good person. But I've found that the best way for me to at least get close to succeeding in multiple areas simultaneously is being okay with falling short of perfect. And I will say that that has become more challenging, you know, especially in the last year. You know, we've we, we've had a baby, Sky, who's now almost one years old. 
um, you know, the the you know work is 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 really something that I'm dedicating a lot of time and and energy and passion to. And then of course I have my wife Nicole, who you know is, is you know been in my life for ten years, and I want to make sure that you know her everything is great all the time. And so I constantly feel this tension. You know, it's if I'm not if I'm not working, I feel some guilt that you know I could do more. And if I'm not with Sky or Nicole, I feel some guilt that you know I'm not doing enough for them. And so there's constant te- tension. There's constant pressure. But I think ultimately recognizing that you're going to have to fall short of perfect is the only way to really enjoy everything in the moment and recognize that it's okay. And to get comfortable with that kind of failure in yourself and recognize that every time you fail is an opportunity to learn and to get better and to do a little bit better next time. I, I always say that's the hardest thing for me, which is like, you know, bluntly, I'm always failing at something, failing at being a son, but I'm crushing it at being an entrepreneur, failing at being a fund manager, but I'm crushing it at being a son, whatever those are. But we spoke about letting people go. I want to start on actually the hiring process itself. I see a lot of mistakes here. How do you actually structure the hiring process for a product team? And Jack, picture me as like a, an, a younger founder. Like, how do you advise me on how to hire and structure that process? You'll hear me say this a lot. You could ask me about just about any question about how to apply process to it. And I'll go back to the same kind of design thinking process because the beauty of design, the beauty of design thinking is that it's a way of solving problems. It's a process for problem solving. And by the way, you know, having not having a team member that you need, that's a problem for the organization and one that you have to figure out how to solve. And so I really look at every process as this iterative process that, you know, it starts with defining the problem and hiring is the same, right? If you're a starting founder or a public company CEO or whatever it might be, before you start the process of actually looking for a candidate, you have to understand and define the problems within your organization that need solving through hiring somebody new. And I think what you find when you do that exercise is that oftentimes you can solve those problems by changing something existing within the organization, changing a process, moving somebody between roles, changing their scope or, or the responsibilities, doing a reorg. All of these things are different tools you have at your disposable, the disposal to solve a problem without necessarily needing to bring in someone. Now, oftentimes the problem you're facing is you've got a gap in skill sets. You need some, you need an additional person, right? Whatever it might be. And once you've identified that problem and, and the scope and responsibility that is required from that person, then you can start the hiring process. But I think that's, you know, the thing I think I can add most to anybody who's thinking about hiring is you now there are plenty of books you can read about how to interview, what questions to ask, you know, what to look for, things like that. But I think what people often forget is that step zero or that step negative one where you're actually really defining what you need in the first place. How do you do that effectively? Like I, I'm constantly hiring and I'm like, well, people are like, do you have a job description? I'm like, not really. I just know I need this person and they're going to do newsletters and YouTube and, and uh, copyright for the blog. I've not really done the JD. How, how do, would you advise me? Yeah, and to be clear, you know, I think based on the stage of the company and, the, and this, the, the need for that role, like you don't always need a JD. It doesn't always need to be exactly prescriptive. And I'd imagine, Harry, that you have a really good sense for what you need, what you're looking for, and what that person is going to be responsible for when they join. Um, and you've come to that sense by taking in a bunch of, you know, different information from the things that you're working on, the people you're working with, the opportunities you have in front of you, the vision of where you want to go. All of those things come together to help clarify for you what it is you're looking for. That's basically this process, right? You have to start by talking to the people. You got to understand, like, what needs to do your team members have? You know, where do they feel stretched thin? What skill set gaps do they see? Just like when you're building a product, you start by c- talking with the customers. You know, in this world, when you're hiring somebody, your customer is your team. You're trying to make their their jobs easier. You're trying to make them more efficient. You're trying to make them, you know, enjoy the work they are doing more, not have to do some of the work that, you know, they're less equipped to do or less passionate about. And so it really starts with having those conversations, talking with the people you work with, understanding their needs, understanding where they see the gaps. And you got to take in all that information, you need to parse it and you need to come out of it with some instincts around, you know, what it is you need to hire. Can I ask you, in terms of like the process for hiring new team members at Snap, though, for product, like, is it like a meeting with a PM and then a meeting with someone else and then a meeting with you? Like, what does that actual process look like? 
It depends on the role. It depends on the level. It, it depends which team they're sitting in. Um, but for the most part, you know, I think like many companies, we we have a screening call first. It's usually just 30 minutes. It's kind of a, a get to know you. You know, you you provide some information about the role. You ask a few questions. Make sure that you know, there's there's at least a, a pretty strong likelihood of a fit. And you do that so that you're not wasting the time of, you know, six or seven people in an interview loop spending, you know, 45 minutes each with this person, which is time consuming, especially when you're in hyper growth, like people will spend a lot of time interviewing. And so those screens are a really important way to make sure that, you know, that is time well spent. Um, I think once you get into the interview stage, you know, I think one thing that is really important when we're doing our hiring is making sure that the the panel of the folks interviewing this person are diverse and, you know, not just from a ethnicity standpoint or socioeconomic standpoint, but but also from a, a roles and discipline standpoint. You know, if you're a product manager at Snap, you're going to be working very closely with engineers. You're going to be working very closely with designers. You're going to have to be able to you know, juggle all of these different roles and disciplines and work well with them. And so we want to make sure that our panel is well-rounded from that front and and can really, you know, gauge how well this person can work across those different disciplines. One of the biggest hiring mistakes you've made, the biggest for me has always been I, I've over-indexed on logos. I think young founders in particular do this. They kind of question their own judgments. So they go, oh, wow, you were at Pinterest and X before, and it gives us confidence. What are your biggest mistakes? I would say that the biggest mistake in hiring is actually not a mistake that leads you to hiring the wrong person. It's how you deal with the moments when you do hire the wrong person. Because, you know, interviewing is hard. It is not a perfect science. And we make mistakes. We all do. And, you know, I think sometimes the candidates make a mistake too. They think they want this job. Once they're there and they're working on it, they realize it's not a good fit for them for some reason, right? These things happen. So there's, there's, uh, you know, this this kind of risk on both sides of the equation. And so it's never going to be perfect. So the biggest mistake you can make is when you bring somebody on who's not a good fit, not dealing with that quickly. Because have somebody who's not performing or not getting up to speed quickly enough becomes an anchor for the entire team. And, you know, I think one of the most impactful ways to make a team more efficient is to make sure that those low performers are moving on. Um, and that is a cycle that happens pretty quickly. When you hire somebody, you know pretty quickly whether or not they're going to have what it takes in that role. And so I think the biggest hiring mistake that that you know many people make and that I myself have made in the past is not actually you know being decisive enough in those moments when you realize it's not a good fit. I once heard that if you're doing hiring right, you get it right 50% of the time. What would you say your right ratio is? That's a really good question. You know, I think that's about right, by the way. You know, I think that you're you're going to to get it wrong about 50% of the time. Now, that doesn't mean 50% of the people you hire aren't going to work out. But I will say about 50% of the people we hire end up changing their role or tweaking it or working on something slightly different because over time we realize that there's a better fit within that. Um, I would say that for the most part, you know, the people we hire we'll stick around for a while because, you know, I think we have a good sense of of what makes somebody successful at Snap. But of course, we're never perfect there. And I do think that that 50% mark is is probably at least a good good one to strive for. I want to move to the future because I could talk to you all day. Tell me, uh, there's a couple of different elements in particular. Developing world, it's not one that like Snap has focused explicitly on uh, really before. Uh, how do you think about the developing world today from a product strategy perspective? Yeah, you know, it, it certainly has been a focus for us over the, the, the last, you know, five years or so. In, in 2018, you know, we took on this project to basically rewrite the entire Android app from scratch. Because, you know, obviously when you're looking at, you know, the rest of the world, most people are using Android devices. You know, in the US and especially in the US for early adopters of Snap, the vast majority of them were using an iPhone. And so our app was was largely designed and 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 you know most performant on an iPhone. And that meant that we had made our product unintentionally very difficult to use or frustrating the user, inaccessible for the majority of the world. And so in 2018 we realized that the tech debt that we had built up over time, building all of these features, innovating as quickly as we had, had just built up to the point where the app was 
basically unusable. Now, the really exciting thing in that moment of time was that there were millions of people across the world still using Snap in spite of how difficult it was to do something as simple as open the app and wait for it to load and start up. So we re rebuilt it from scratch. And you know, because of that, we saw a huge acceleration in adoption across the world. And so I think that was a really key learning for us as an organization that you know, how accessible your product is and making sure that it feels like it was made for you, no matter who you are, no matter where you live, is a really important part of, of building products for, you know, at scale. And so now I think when we think about building this product, you know, for markets across the world, for different demographics, all sorts of different people with different needs and different cultures, we have this mentality of, of trying to build a local product globally. No matter where you are, we want you to open the app and feel like this was made for you, you know, likely with somebody who really understand your needs and, and, and what you, you want out of it. Do you think that's possible? And what I mean by that is like when you look at actually consumer preferences around UIs, and I'm sure you're a product nerd. Um, I, I mean, I, I like to think I am, but I'm a venture investor. So we proclaim to be experts in things that we know nothing about as a hobby. Um, but like when you look at like, you know, Southeast Asia, China, Japan, their UIs are incredibly different to ours. They're noisy. They're very colorful. They're very busy compared to much more simplistic, simple but I would say beautiful framing that we have in, in Europe and North America. Can you have a universally appreciated UI design product with such divergent consumer preferences? No, I don't think you can. You can't be perfect. You can't be optimal everywhere. And so, you know, sometimes you have to decide to do something slightly different in a different market. And, you know, to make that decision, you have to feel like that market is valuable enough for you to go make the investments to differentiate your, your product there. But I would say certain things like the amount of, you know, teaching in the app, the language that's used, you know, like those are things that are are pretty cheap to to distinguish in different markets. Now, other pieces of, of you know, a product like it's the core product value you're delivering that's really difficult to change across markets. And so what we try to focus on are universal things, things that no matter where you are in the world, this is something that is going to be valuable. For example, you know, having conversations with your closest friends and family and empowering those conversations to be more fun, you know, more playful, more intimate and, and safer, that's something that's universal. You know, no matter where you are in the world, if we can build an experience that makes that better, people are going to love it. Where is Snap not big today, but you think will be in the next few years, country-wise? You know, Japan has been a very interesting market for us. I've always thought that that is a market in which, you know, Snap would really take off because there are certain elements to it. It's very visual. It's, you know, it's playful. The The lenses that we offer in augmented reality is something that, you know, the the Japanese market generally likes to to really experiment with. Now, at the same time, they have line, right? So they have they have a product experience that they are using to communicate all the time. And it's, you know, kind of saturated that market. But Snap has always been able to overcome these other messaging services because it does it in such a different way. It offers visual communication, you know, that empowers a different type of, of conversation. And so I think that's a market where, you know, with enough focus, it, it's something that we can kind of take to the next stage. Did you copy cacao stories? So I would say the answer to that is no, you know, beyond the stories element of cacao stories, it was a very different product. And I'll tell you actually what stories came from, because I think it's a great story and actually is, you know, I think one of, one of my favorite analogies to one of my favorite design quotes, which is the Henry Ford quote, you know, if I had asked my customers what they wanted, they would have told me faster horses, but Henry Ford, you know, went beyond the solution the customers were giving him. And he looked at the problem, which was they wanted to get from point A to point B faster. And he built the automobile, which was a better way of doing that than a faster horse, right? I love that story because that's exactly what we're talking about when we say focus you know, on the problem, on the implicit needs, not what customers are explicitly telling you. And with stories, you know, what we were hearing from the community was they wanted a way to send a snap to everyone. They wanted it to be easier for them to go take a snap, tap everybody on the send to list and blast it off. Now we recognize that if we did that, it would really dilute 
the feeling of receiving a snap. Right now, when you receive a snap from a friend, you know that they tapped your name. And as subtle as it is, that makes you feel special. You know that that person was thinking of you. And that's the beauty. That's the beauty of, of, you know, of snapping. If we were to give you a button that allowed you to select everyone, you wouldn't feel as special. And so we took this, this, you know, problem people were telling us, which is, hey, I want a way of sending to everyone. And we invented a new way that wouldn't dilute the experience of, of, of snapping but actually in turn would, would spark more conversations because it was this broadcast forum to your closer friends. It was ephemeral. So people felt comfortable posting raw, authentic in the moment content, but it also gave everyone a chance to reply, which would then spark those conversations that could lead to that really meaningful one-to-one snapping behavior. Do you know one thing I used early in the marketing of the show? We used to promote, obviously, uh, sorry, I don't mean that savagely, but we used to promote Snap. Uh, I was like, hey, follow us on Snap. Um, and it was like, follow age that means 1996. Um, and uh, and like you had like, you know, we had thousands and thousands who did. And the wonderful thing about being as homogenous a market as we have listening, you have thousands of Simons, thousands of Davids. And I used to like go, hey, David, check out the newest show. Blah, blah, blah. And then you could literally just tap 300 Davids. <laughs> And they would get it and they'd be like, wow, individual, that is amazing. Um, sorry, that was just like recounting back to my memory. I love it. That's guerrilla marketing and it's finest right there. Oh, yeah, yeah. We used to do that a lot. It works brilliantly well, by the way. Um, the second thing I have to ask is about AR. What's your vision for the future of AR? It's like we always hear the talk of it. Um, is it always through the phone camera lens? How do we think about that? Uh, you know, I think the the what's so incredible about Snapchat is that it really redefined what the camera can be. And I, you know, before Snapchat, the camera was really a tool to capture a moment, to save for later, or to, you know, and, and whether that was an artistic thing through, you know, artistic photography, or it was, you know, for family settings and, and you know, saving those moments that were meaningful that you wanted to relive later. Snapchat really took the camera and it said, okay, what if this was a tool for communication? What if we made it, you know, more visual, more immersive, so that, you know, a, a picture says a thousand words, right? And so that was the power of Snapchat. It just made it so much faster to have these immersive conversations that really made it feel like you were there with another person. And so people started using the camera a lot because it turns out that talking with friends is a far more frequent behavior than capturing an image of something pretty. And so people were opening our camera hundreds of times a day to send, you know, a snap to somebody to continue a conversation. That led to a bunch of other opportunities, and it really helped us think about like other ways of using the camera, right? You can you, we can you can use the camera to tell stories. You can use the camera to you know post content to the Snap Map, so people get a, get a view of what's happening around the world. But ultimately, the most exciting and most important opportunity for Snap was that you could use the camera to augment the reality around you, because now we had a viewfinder into the world and into your setting and into the things that you were experiencing, and so. That's really where AR came from. And it started with these, you know, pretty, you know, playful lenses that, you know, helped you communicate with a friend or an express an emotion. But ultimately, we found that some of those lenses could actually be very utilitarian. It could help you solve a math problem. It could help you, you know, understand what are the ratings behind this wine bottle by pointing your camera at it. And so I think that the future of augmented reality is going to be around creating more and more utility and through the way of understanding the environment around you. And so, you know, I think that's really where AR is going. And, you know, like all technologies that find some form of product market fit, they tend to evolve pretty quickly. And Snap has certainly helped AR find that product market fit and, and find a ubiquitous way of people playing with these things. And um, so I think that kind of charts the, the, the path for the future there. I, I love that in terms of the utility value created there. And final one, I promise. But does that still go through the phone camera lens though? Or does it go through contact lenses or glasses? What, what happened to the snap glasses? Yeah, the snap, it's something we're still working on. And, you know, I can't say much, but there's some really exciting progress. So, you know, we fundamentally believe that, that AR is going to become better and better. It's going to become more and more useful. And ultimately, the, the promise of augmented reality is that it can help technology move to the background, right? So you don't have to have this thing between you and the world. And glasses, you know, are a better form factor for, the, for, for that. It can really take technology out of the way when you don't need it, but overlay it on the world when it's useful too. And so, you know, for us, that is the, the pinnacle of augmented reality. 
and why we're pursuing it. I think ultimately augmented reality will find its its true essence through glasses. Today, it's extremely powerful on the phone and the amount of engagement and, and the developer ecosystem we've been able to build around that ubiquity is what's going to empower us to be really well positioned for that future. But the glasses are success when they launched. The first version of the glasses were, you know, an incredibly fun to, thing to get out in the world. And, you know, I think it was the first time we had shipped a hardware product and we saw some really exciting buzz around it. Um, but ultimately, it was very difficult for us to deliver, you know, to that demand in the spike that that came with it. And I think in many ways, the first product we launched, um, you know, it had some pitfalls, right? I think we knew that it was early. We wanted to get something in people's hands. And our philosophy has always been, you know, whether it's with software products or it's with our hardware, get these products into the hands of real people as quickly as possible and use that to inform the step you need to take next to make it magical. So I would say that the first version of Spectacles, you know, obviously it wasn't an iPhone moment. It's not something that has generated an enormous amount of revenue for the company, but it has absolutely helped us hone in on where to take these things in the future. And so from that regard, it's massive success. I think it's cool. I, 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 I always thought it was awesome. Um, right, we're going to do a quick five because otherwise I'll, I'll take all of it. All right. Um, tell me, how has angel investing impacted your product mindset, Jack? I think it's made it clear that no matter what stage a company you're in, you have to maintain a startup mentality. And, you know, that is a constant reminder of that. Tell me, most important skills to build early on in your career and product? Get really good at focusing on the problem and defining the problem and let the solutions follow. What would you say is the biggest mistake? You're very good at Quickfire. What would you say is the biggest mistake founders make when hiring product teams? I would say not hiring somebody who's willing to play a bunch of different roles. If you're hiring for too much specialization, you're not going to find somebody who's passionate enough and excited enough to really get their hands dirty and do all the work that's required at that early stage. How has becoming a parent changed your operating mindset? It's really clarified my priorities. I mean, I've got, I've got two things going on. You know, I've got work and I've got my family. And I used to be a, you know, I and mean, it still am in many ways, but I used to be a very restless soul. You know, I'd be sitting, uh, you know, at work and I'd know it was, you know, great waves out, outside and it's a beautiful day. And part of me would be like, ah, oh, like I wish I could surf right now. And now there's none of that. It's like, you know, I'm working when I'm working and I'm with my family when I'm with my family. So it's really clarified those things. What one piece of advice would you give to a product leader starting a new role today? Get vulnerable fast. You know, I think the most important thing to do when you're starting in a new role or in any role is to be willing to to share your insecurities and your vulnerabilities because it then gives you the time and the space to learn and to grow because you're not going to be perfect day one. You're going to have to learn the environment. You're going to have to learn the people. You're going to have to learn the product. There's so many things you're going to have to learn in order to become good at what you do. And the more that you are open about the fact that you're not good yet, the more people will give you the feedback and the time and the space to get good. What are your insecurities? <laughs> yes. Oh, what, what are, I, you know, I'm insecure about everything. You know, I think imposter syndrome has been the, the thing that has been most consistent throughout my career. Um, you know, it just always feels like I'm surrounded by brilliant people you know, that are so capable at so many things. And, uh, you know, in so many ways, you know, no matter where I look, I find somebody who's better at something than I am. And that's the beauty of, you know, working at a company where everybody is smart, everybody is talented, everybody's creative, everybody's driven. But, you know, it can make you wonder sometimes, like, am I good enough at all of these different things? And the reality is, if you surround yourself with great people, you don't have to be good enough at everything because you can lean on other people. When I say like master product mind, I immediately, for me, think about two people, Scott Balski and Antoine Martin. When I say product master for you, excluding those two, you can't take mine. Um, who would you say? You know, this is going to be the most uh, expected answer of all time, but I would say Evan Spiegel and I would say Steve Jobs. 
Yeah, I would, I would give you that. Yeah, pretty expected. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I'm with you. What's Ab's biggest weakness? I would say his ambitions for where he wants things to go can very occasionally get in the way of where things are. And that is the beauty of the fact that he surrounded himself with leaders who are willing to help him see that bigger picture. Which company product strategy do you most respect and admire? When you look around you at the companies that we have, where are you like smart? They did really well and I respect that product strategy. So I'll give you another maybe expected answer, uh, you know, given everything that's going on in the world. But I think the reason why I, I think it's so exciting is, is maybe different. So OpenAI, obviously it is, you know, the talk of the town right now and for, for good reason. But I think what is so interesting about their strategy is that it really bucks convention, right? I, I am the first to tell you that you should not build a technology in search of a problem. You have to start with a problem. I've said that probably a thousand times throughout this podcast. But what's really interesting about what OpenAI has done is that they recognized that artificial intelligence as a technology is actually fundamentally different. You know, by nature, AI is non-deterministic. It's generative, right? Which is both what makes it so exciting and somewhat terrifying. But it means when you're investing deeply in building this technology, you don't know exactly where it's going to go. You don't know the exact outcomes. But they knew enough to know that investing in this and get, getting this technology good enough would be able to solve a myriad of problems. And you know, I think they even surprised themselves with ChatGPT and how quickly they found product market fit. But that's the genius of their strategy. They invested everything they had in building a technology that they had conviction in would be able to solve many, many problems. And so they've really helped me, you know, I think, think differently about, you know, at least AI is a technology where, you know, you don't have to start with the problem you're solving. You can start with the technology and then it can be applied basically everywhere. And I think AI is really going to be transformative for that reason. Jack, I can't thank you enough for this. I've so loved it. I'm sorry for switching hats to being a therapist for, for a little of the questions, but you've been amazing. So huge thank you. Hey, we all need our therapy. I'm going to go cry myself to sleep and I'll wake up feeling fresh and great tomorrow. So 